general superintendent are pardoning the law. Hymns and songs, number 105. Gospel hymns and songs, 105. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed this name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll take him with me anywhere. I'll tell the world how Jesus saved me and how he gave me a life brand new. And I know that if you trust him, that all he gave me, he'll give to you. I'll tell the world that he is my savior. No other one can love me so. My life, my all is his forever. And where he leads me, I will go. I'll tell the world that he is coming. It may be near. Or far away but we must live as if his coming will be tomorrow or today for when he comes and life is over for those who love him there's more to be eyes have never seen the wonders that he is preparing for you and for me. Who oh, tell the world that we are a Christian, be not ashamed, his name to bear. Who oh, tell the world that you are a Christian and take him with you everywhere.
to continue with our Bible reading. But before we read, shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we are asking that you will open our eyes of understanding as we read your word today. We are asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us, as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue for the reading now. Today we're going to continue with our Bible reading. But before we read, shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we're asking that you will open our eyes of understanding as we read your word today. We're asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The second book of Moses, called Exodus, chapter 26. Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, and blue and purple and scarlet. With cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. The length of one curtain shall be eight and twenty cubits, and the breadth of one curtain four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have one measure. The five curtains shall be coupled together one to another, and other five curtains shall be coupled one to another. And thou shalt make loops of blue upon the edge of the one curtain from the selvage in the coupling, and likewise shalt thou make in the uttermost edge of another curtain in the couplings of the second. Fifty loops shalt thou make in the one curtain, and fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second, that the loops may take hold one of another. And thou shalt make fifty tatches of gold, and couple the curtains together with the tatches, and it shall be one tabernacle. And thou shalt make curtains of goat's hair to be a covering upon the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shalt thou make. The length of one curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the breadth of one curtain four cubits, and the eleven curtains shall be all of one measure. And thou shalt couple five curtains by themselves, and six curtains by themselves, and shalt double the sixth curtain in the forefront of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make fifty loops on the edge of the one curtain that is outmost in the coupling, and fifty loops in the edge of the curtain which coupleth the second. And thou shalt make fifty tatches of brass, and put the tatches into the loops, and couple the tent together, that it may be one. And the remnant that remaineth of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remaineth, shall hang over the back side of the tabernacle. And a cubit on the one side, and a cubit on the other side of that which remaineth in the length of the curtains of the tent, it shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle, on this side and on that side, to cover it. And thou shalt make a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red, and a covering above of badger's skins. And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of shittim wood, standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenons shall there be in one board, set in order one against another. Thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle twenty boards on the south side southward. And thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side there shall be twenty boards, and there forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward thou shalt make six boards, and two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides. And they shall be coupled together beneath, and they shall be coupled together above the head of it unto one ring. Thus shall it be for them both, they shall be for the two corners. And they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars 
for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from end to end. And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold, and make their rings of gold for places for the bars. And thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work. With cherubims shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches, that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil, and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side. And thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen, wrought with needlework. And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And their hooks shall be of gold, and thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. Chapter 27 And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be foursquare, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass. And upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it. As it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side southward there shall be hangings for the court of fine twined linen of an hundred cubits long for one side. And the twenty pillars thereof and their twenty sockets shall be of brass. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And likewise for the north side, in length there shall be hangings of an hundred cubits long, and his twenty pillars and their twenty sockets of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side shall be hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. And the breadth of the court on the east side, eastward, shall be fifty cubits. The hangings of one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And on the other side shall be hangings fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the gate of the court shall be an hanging of twenty cubits, of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework. And their pillars shall be four, and their sockets four. All the pillars round about the court shall be filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver, and their sockets of brass. The length of the court shall be an hundred cubits, and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twined linen, and their sockets of brass. All the vessels of the tabernacle, and all the service thereof, and all the pins thereof, and all the pins of the court, shall be of brass. And thou shalt command the children of Israel, that they bring thee pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. In the tabernacle of the congregation, without the veil which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons, shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. You have just listened to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim, pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. 
you have just listened to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. We now bring you power ministrations from regions, states, and nations across the world.
heart, your mind, your soul, your body, everything you desire. The Lord is pouring the blessing of God upon your life tonight in Jesus' name. Supernatural freedom through Christ. Live from Charles de Gaulle Stadium, the Republic of Benin. A French-speaking West African country with its capital in Porto Novo. 22nd to 27th June, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily. Sunday service at 0700 hours GMT. And that's not all. There will be ministers, church workers, and professionals conference with a theme. Fulfilling the ministry with heaven in view. Teenagers, campus students, and young adults will be inspired to arise and shine at Impact Academy. Ministry is God's servant. The convener of GCK. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumi. With global choir ministering from across the world and special guest music ministration by Dan Luten. Broadcast to the world live via satellites, radio and television, and all our social media platforms. GCK Season 3. Your time has come. GCK, the gospel to every creature. We are taking it back. Praise the Lord. Testimonies abound of great things God is doing amidst globally online as well as in this alpha location time will fail us but we just listen to two testimonies now to whet your appetite and to let you know what god did for others he will do for you the first testifier please Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord is doing great things during this program. And we have testimonies here that we are going to share with us to the glory of God. My name is Dr. Dele Ogufo I'm a family physician. And we have this testimony from this 15-year-old boy here. Let's hear from him. Praise the Lord. My name is Peculia Chukunti. I'm a born again child by the grace of God. I'm 15 years old. Listen to my testimony. May God bless you. Praise the Lord. Yeah. This is my son. He's 15 years. Since when I give birth to him, he has been birth waiting. Since he has been birth waiting, since 15 years now. When we came to the program, uh, Camp Grand, on, on the day that they started the program, when we just read there, he told me that, Mommy, this, today, as, as, I, as I came to this program, I will not go back with this problem again. In short, as I've reached here, the problem is over. I say, Amen. Then after the program, we get, went back home. Yesterday, he woke up. I asked him whether the deep is, he said no. This morning, he woke up again. I checked if his wrapper, everything, he did not bed well. And before, he would bed well three times in the night before they would break. But these two days, yesterday, I wanted to give him the testimony. I said, let me leave it here. Let me see the next day again whether he would bed well. I said, the Lord, I do is may his name alone be highly exalted. May the Lord increase the grace of our daddy in the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. He has taken his freedom back from bedwetting. It will never happen again. Amen. Let's listen to the next testifier, Sister Rose Fibile. Praise the Lord. Children of God, praise the Lord. I'm Sister Rose Fibile. By the grace of God, I'm born again. I want to thank God and also share this testimony to encourage us as we are coming for this GCK that one day to God we also do your own. Praise the Lord. I discovered that last year, almost a year, which was almost a year or thereabouts, I discovered I was having a pain in my left lower abdomen. I don't know what it is. 
If I want to climb like a step like this now, I'll be feeling that pain. I dare not just climb like that. Otherwise, like, I will injure myself seriously. So I don't know what it is. And I was afraid to go to the hospital to go and see the doctor. Because the day was just ministering different things to me. And again, I discovered that if I want to walk, sometimes my tune leg, the tune is like, want to touch each other as if, ah, I don't want to listen to some kind of instruction, so that is it, this or that. But I keep believing God. When I attend the GCK, they will say, check yourself after prayer. I will check. It's like the thing is still there. But after during that Bayesa crusade, people were just sharing testimony. And something came to me and said, look at these people. She they have been attending the crusades. They didn't receive their own. But this time now, God have done their own for them. So that as I keep coming, so also one day too, God will also do my own. And after then, I discovered that that pain, I no longer feel it again. The one that I'm working, sometimes I have to control myself so that people will not, not understand. I say, ah, how is this person working like? Everything I've gone since after then till eternity. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We thank God for the miracle and the miracle will permanent in your life in Jesus' name. Everything has gone. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the Bible study today. Thank you for your children. Thank you for invitees. Thank you for everyone. We thank you for those who are gathered everywhere, all over the world, connected with us, listening to the Bible study. We're asking, O oh Lord, that the study of your word will profit everyone here tonight in Jesus' name. We pray that your word will not be lost on anyone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're coming back to Galatians chapter 2. Every Monday, we study, as you know, from a book of the Bible. And this time now, we're in the epistle of Paul. To the Galatians, we've studied from chapter 1 all through to chapter 2, verse 14. Tonight, we're looking at Galatians chapter 2 from verse 15. Galatians 2, verse 15, all through to 21. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, 16, it says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we who have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no man, no flesh, be justified. Then in verse 17, But if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ, the minister of sin, God forbid. Verse 18, For if I build again the things which I destroyed. I make myself a transgressor. Then in verse 19, For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The verses reveal to us one thing, justification. The source of that justification, the way of that justification, and what God has done 
to produce and to grant us that justification. And then there are two sets of people. The Jews were there, and there were those who were thinking that justification, redemption, salvation, and reconciliation with God will come through obedience to the law and the commandments of God. They thought by their own works, the works of their hand, by their own endeavor, their self-righteousness, they will have justification or righteousness. And then Paul the apostle said, then we frustrate the grace of God because if righteousness could come by the works of the law, then Christ would have died in vain. The second group of people that actually believe what we ought to believe, the people that believe that no, salvation does not come by our own works, that justification cannot come by our self-righteousness, that the only way that salvation could come, redemption could come, justification could come, is that we lean, we believe, we rely on Christ and Christ alone. And so that's the reasoning here. We're looking at the message tonight, justification by faith in Christ, the only Savior. Not Christ and human effort, Christ and works of the law, Christ and human endeavor, Christ and self-righteousness, Christ and the Jewish law, no. Christ and Christ alone. Justification by faith in Christ, the only Savior. The message tonight is divided into three parts. Number one, the law without Christ attracts judgment in fury. Somebody running after the law and obeying the commandments of the law and trying that by himself in his own strength in his own power he will fulfill the law and be saved there's judgment on such an individual there is no way anyone in his own strength in his own power in self-righteousness can fulfill the demand of the law so the law without christ attracts judgment in fury number two the lostness of compromisers judged by for their falsehood the preachers the soul winners the leaders the ministers who will not teach christ christ alone as the source and the fountain and the foundation of her salvation but then they compromise they lean towards the jewish law and try to lean towards the works of christ and they try to marry and merge everything together they are still lost because they are not depending on christ and christ alone for salvation for redemption the lostness of compromisers judged for their falsehood. Point number three, our life in Christ after justification by faith. We've come to Christ. We're justified. Our sins are forgiven. We're redeemed. Our names are written in the book of life. After salvation, what next? After justification, what next? Now we are saved by the grace of God and the grace of God works in our lives. What will that grace produce in our lives? The life we live after being justified, after being saved, after being redeemed, after being reaching in the book of life in heaven, the life we live after we are justified by faith in Christ. Our life in Christ after justification by faith. Let's come to number one. Number one, the law without Christ attracts judgment in fury. In Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 15, we who are Jews by nature 
and not sinners of the Gentiles. Verse 16, knowing that a man, Jew or Gentile, a man self-righteous or self-condemned, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we be, have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith, the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Then in verse 17, it says, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He's telling us three things here. Number one, the guilt of the self-righteous before God. Number two, the gulf between self-righteousness and true godliness. Number three, the goal for the self-righteous without grace. Look at number one. Number one, the guilt of the self-righteous before God, the one who comes to God and he says, I've not met Christ, but I'm saved. I've not believed in Christ, but I'm saved. I will not give my heart, my life to Christ, but I'm saved. How are you saved? By my own effort, by my own trying, by my own obedience to the commandment of God, by myself turning over a new leaf and doing the right thing i don't need christ i am saved by myself the guilt of such a self-righteous one in the sight of god job chapter 25 we're looking at verse 4 in job chapter 25 verse 4 how then can man be justified with god or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Anyone after Adam, since Adam, anyone after Adam fell, anyone that has the nature of Adam, the depravity of Adam, and is born by woman, anyone white or black or brown or yellow or red, anyone a philosopher, a psychologist, anyone an educated one, an illiterate, anyone on the face of the earth in any generation, anyone in church or outside the church, anyone of any religion or pedigree, it says, how then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Look at verse 5. In verse 5, behold, even, the mo even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. It says, even the stars that are higher, higher than men, greater than men, they are not clean, they are not pure in his sight. How much less the man who drinks sin as his habitual character. Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 19. It says in Romans chapter 3 verse 19, now we know that what things soever the Lord saith, it said to them who are under the law that every mouth, think about that, every mouth, the people who boast, the people who say they are righteous without Christ, the people who say they are religion, whether the religion is Christianity in course, or Judaism or any other religion, the people who say they are righteous by themselves and the people who come even to the church, but they will not repent, they will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they think they are alright by themselves, they like the 
they live, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't do this, they don't do that, and they depend on their own strength and character alone that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. All the world become guilty in the sight of God. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it tells us, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Take that to heart. No matter what you do, no matter how you try to be clean by yourself, righteous by yourself, without salvation in Christ, you are guilty in the sight of God. It says, uh, it says there, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Let's come to number two there. Number two there is the gulf between self-righteousness and true godliness self-righteousness that's what you produce here on earth and godliness that's what you get from god by the grace of god and the product of the earth self-righteousness is so far away from the godliness that is the produce from heaven there is a gulf between self-righteousness and true godliness it also says in galatians uh, chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 16 it says knowing that a man a jewish man a gentle man knowing that a man a man of the old uh, primitive dispensation or a man of today of the civilized dispensation knowing that a man a man that is educated in the things of the world in character transformation and they know how to say if you have this a challenge this is how to calm down this is how to live any man like that or a man that just lives his natural life knowing that a man any man in church among us here among them over there in the world anyone i've been coming to the church for 20 years now and i know how to clean up myself i know how to improve myself i know how to stop this and stop that such a man if there is no salvation you can increase your goodness you can be very generous and you can have self-righteousness yet there is a gulf between self-righteousness and true godliness knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law by the works of the law the works of the law may be deep may be high may be broad the works of the law may be many you might multiply them and you can refer to them you might keep a diary of what you do of the works of the law the works of the law i gave that i did that i said that i endeavor to do that no man can be justified by the works of the law but by faith of jesus christ even we have believed in jesus christ that's the real godliness there and that we might be justified by the faith of christ and not by the works of the law not by the works of the law it says because for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified by the works of the law obedience to the law and then keeping even the moral law the see the ceremonial law and the civil law every kind of law by your trial by yourself no one can be justified and there is a gulf between the self-righteous and the one who is truly godly look at philippians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 6 philippians chapter 3 we're reading from verse 6 here is saul when he was saul self-righteous here is saul saul when by the works of the law he thought it was all right he could even claim perfection but now he shows us 
all that perfection of the natural man all that morality of the natural man they are works of the law and they cannot justify anyone philippians chapter 3 verse 6 concerning zeal persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless that is who he was but he wasn't saved he wasn't born again his name was not written in the book of life he could tell anyone anywhere as to the righteousness which is in the law blameless perfect spotless but look at verse 7 it says in verse 7 but what things were gain to me those I counted loss for Christ when I met Christ I saw I discovered that all those things I bragged about all those things I was proud of they were nothing and so I had to count them loss for Christ verse 8 in verse 8 it says yea doubtless and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I me win Christ he said I have to give up that one I have to give up the self-righteousness before I could have the Savior's righteousness I had to give up the righteousness that I produce by my human effort so that I would have the righteousness that Christ himself alone has purchased look at verse 9 in verse 9 it says and be found in him not having mine own righteousness and be found in him not having not bragging and not testifying about my own righteousness self-righteousness even after we are born again if you go back to you know the fact that actually i'm born again now i thank god i believe in the lord jesus christ but really but really look at my life i never never smoked in my life i never drank in my life i never did this i never did that and you are rejoicing in that and you minimize the righteousness of christ and you minimize the righteousness that came to you that was given to you by grace and as a gift then you are back to the old self paul the apostle said and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of christ the righteousness which is of god by faith look at number three here number three we're looking at the goal for the self-righteous without grace the goal the bitterness that is for the one who is self-righteous without the grace of God in Galatians chapter 2 verse 17 Galatians 2 17 but if while we seek to be justified by Christ we ourselves also have found sinners is therefore Christ the minister of sin God forbid he said are we trying to justify ourselves actually it was uh, referring to what Peter the apostle had just done he was uh, eating with the Gentiles uh, before the Jews from Jerusalem came because he believed and he knew that Jew or Gentile Peter or any of those people in Antioch is by grace were saved it's not because you are a Jew that you are saved. It's not because you are is a Gentile that is not saved. By the same grace, by the same love of God, and by the same sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we are both saved. But then when those Jews came from Jerusalem and he saw them, he thought they might question me why I'm eating with the Gentiles. You know why he thought 
and they thought the salvation of the Jews who are circumcised that salvation is up there and then the salvation of the Gentiles who are not circumcised that salvation is down below there and he, saw, he felt that the Jews in their salvation even though it is by Christ that the Jews are higher than the Gentiles who are born again and so he let those people he was eating with and then Paul the apostle said Peter if while we seek to be justified by Christ we ourselves also are found sinners hypocrites pretenders and we are not following after the truth the truth of the grace of God is there therefore Christ the minister of sin what was saying is what you have done in hypocrisy that is sin what you have done is separating yourself from the Gentiles that is sin but now you are born again Christ lives in you was it Christ that made you to be hypocritical was it Christ that made you to withdraw yourself like that is Christ then the minister the originator of sin will you say Peter that what you've done now which is sin would you say that is the product of Christ Christ made me do that he didn't allow any answer he said God forbid God cannot be the originator of sin Christ cannot be the originator of sin he came to take our sin away and so Peter what you've done was not right there's the goal of self-righteousness without grace is saying don't you know what happens to the people who will not remain on Christ and Christ alone Acts chapter 8 reading from verse 19 Acts chapter 8 verse 19 saying give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost look at verse 20 in verse 20 but Peter said unto him thy money perish with thee what's happening here the apostles had come from Jerusalem Peter and John and these people who knew the Lord and believed in the Lord in Samaria they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost understand salvation by grace sanctification by grace Holy Ghost power by grace but he had done work the work of his labor the labor of his hand and the labor of his hand and the work of his hand had given him gotten him money <clears throat> and then he now said by my labor I got money by my works I got money and the result of my labor here is the money give me this power as I give you this money that's why Peter said unto him thy money perish with thee because thou hast taught that the gift of God there we are salvation gift sanctification gift holy ghost baptism gift and this man wanted to buy the gift of god with money you have thought that the gift of god may be purchased with money look at verse 23 there verse 23 i perceive that thou art in the goal of bitterness thou art in the goal of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity anyone that tries to buy salvation by the works of his hand anyone that wants to get to heaven by the works of his hand anyone that uh, ought to thinking he is going to have reconciliation with God by the works of the law he is in the goal of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity but we don't have to go that direction salvation is free 
salvation is a gift and the lord had said for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever a jew or a gentile whosoever believeth in him that's all you need to do you come you forget all your works and you forget all your labor and you forget all your self-righteousness and you come to the lord whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life you will not perish you'll have everlasting life as you come nothing in my hand i bring simply to the cross i clinch could my tears forever flow and my zeal no respite no all these for sin cannot atone thou and thou alone must save and i pray the salvation of god will be ours in jesus name we're coming to point number two now point number two the lostness of compromisers judged for their falsehood we're coming to galatians chapter 2 verse 18 for if i build again the things which i destroyed i make myself a transgressor what does that mean in application to you know the situation on hand there peter had gone in an earlier chapter of uh, of Acts of the Apostles, he had gone to the gentle house Cornelius. He stayed with them. He ate with them. He slept in the rooms they provided him, and he preached the word of God to him. And while he was speaking, the Holy Ghost came on all those that had him. And Peter himself said can anyone forbid water that this should not be baptized in water seeing that they have received the same gift of the holy ghost as we and then in the following chapter he had said for we believe that they will be saved even as us the jews he had broken down he had destroyed the ideology of judaism as he judaism or the obedience to the mosaic law will save anyone he destroyed that and he said by faith faith in christ i will save now paul the apostle said peter you know what you're doing now by withdrawing from eating with those gentiles you're building again the things which you once destroyed and he said i make myself a transgressor if i did that look at verse 19 in verse 19 for i through the law i'm dead to the law that i might live unto god he says it's her faith in christ it's the connection with christ it's putting our trust totally in christ that saves us and we know that whether you're a jew or you're a gentile faith in christ will reconcile you to god christ brings you to god but now we will forget that and we build again the law the law of moses and we build again confidence in the law moses we build what we destroyed before then we make ourselves transgressors the lostness of compromisers judged for their falsehood three things there number one inconsistent transgressors who build on legalism legal the law legalism that's the law, the Jewish system of being reconciled to God. The inconsistent transgressors who build on legalism. Number two, incorrigible teachers who breed lawlessness and lasciviousness. The incorrigible teachers, they have heard, they have known that Christ and Christ alone is the Savior. And now, but they're incorrigible and they keep on that wrong way and that wrong path of the Mosaic law. Number three, incoherent tricksters. It's like they're playing games. It's like they're playing tricks. And 
they are incoherent they cannot even understand themselves they do things they cannot match with what they actually believe they are split personalities they act this way they think another way they go this way but then their direction in their mind is another direction they think about Christ and they're thinking of the law they think about salvation and the justification by faith in Christ but their works and their activity is like upholding and raising up the law of Moses again they are not coherent incoherent tricksters who be, who be clouds is love they be cloud is love that the people they are speaking to cannot see very clearly the law of God anymore because they are incoherent let's come to number one number one inconsistent transgressors who build on legalism we are looking at Acts chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 11 Acts 15 verse 11 but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they you find in that verse we who are the we the Jews they were in a meeting together council together conference together they were considering the salvation and the conversion of the Gentiles and they were all Jews there that they referred to the Gentiles the Gentiles who have been saved through the ministry of Paul and Barnabas and they came to report to them here is what had happened and then they concluded they said but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we Jews shall be saved even as they the Gentiles let's look at a verse we're looking at verse 19 there in verse 19 wherefore my sentence is this that we trouble not them that we Jews Jewish believers trouble not them the Gentiles which from among the Gentiles are turned to God they didn't have circumcision but they turned to God they didn't have all those uh, offerings of the Je of the Jewish people but they turned to God they didn't obey all those mosaic laws but they have turned to God let's not trouble them let's understand it's Calvary let's understand it's Christ that brings salvation from among the Gentiles they are turned to God God. And then he tells us in verse 20, in verse 20 it says, But that we write unto them that they abstain from the pollution of idols. That that one we need to tell them now they are saved by grace, and now they have their love, their allegiance to God and God alone that they turn from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood look at verse 28 in verse 28 for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost it seemed good to the Holy Ghost it's not because of Moses now it's not because of the law of Moses the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things in verse 29 that ye abstain from meats offered to idols so that your love is wholeheartedly given to God and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well ye shall do well fear ye well let's come to number two there number two there we're looking at incorrigible teachers who breach lawlessness and lascivious sins after 
all that had been settled no one should go back again to the law of Moses. No one should confuse anyone anymore with, uh, you know, the law of Moses and go back to Leviticus, each days and don't eat that and go back to Deuteronomy. Here is what you have to do, the statutes and the laws and everything. Nobody should have gone back to that anymore. But there were teachers that were incorrigible. It's just like somebody has been going into a particular religion before a particular denomination before a particular traditional church before and now he comes out of there and he claims to be born again he claims to be for Christ and he claims that it is the grace of Christ that has brought him into the kingdom but now he practices the religion the tradition that he left behind, incorrigible, that although he says, I'm born again by faith in Christ, the practices of that old religion is what he still continues in. And there are some taboos, and there are some don'ts, and there are some things, never, 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 I can never do that. Why? Is that because of the truth in Christ? Because of the grace of God? Uh-uh. Where well, I'm coming from, we never did that there. That's what the Lord is saying, that they are incorrigible teachers who breach lawlessness and lasciviousness. We're looking at Galatians uh, chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh and manifest now there are those who confuse the works of the law and the works of the flesh they don't understand anytime you see works 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 they say works of the law works of the law look at this one this one the works of the flesh as you become born again, you become a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And so the works of the flesh, not works of the law, the works of the flesh that will still try to rear up its ugly head you understand you will not get involved with that you will not say works of the law works of the flesh works of doing good and works of this everything lumped together i am not there look at this now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication that's uncleanness, that's chiviousness. Then in verse 20, it says, idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and various emulations, raw strife, seditions, heresies. Verse 21, it says, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What he's saying is, now we're justified by Christ, and we come to the Lord, we get his sin, we reject, we push away from our lives the works of the law. All those works of the law, the law of Moses, all that we deny, all that we separate from, but we will not indulge in the works of the flesh because anyone indulging in the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. I will inherit the kingdom of God. The Lord confirm it in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two here. Number, uh, number, number three, rather. We're looking at number three. The incoherent tri 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 tricksters who becloud his love. There are people who are incoherent. There are people who contradict themselves. There are people who are not straightforward. And you cannot make them walk in the straight path. You listen to them one day, and then you listen to them another day. You say, preacher, you're contradicting yourself. Preacher, you don't even understand what you're saying. 
they are incoherent now we must not confuse the works of the law and the word of the lord after we are born again look at it this way here is the man here is the past here is the future all that he did in the past will not earn him salvation we don't earn salvation the good things you did in the past the bad things you did in the past will not hinder you getting saved when you put your faith in christ after putting your faith in christ the life that follows after that you will not live that life in lawlessness in evil because you are now saved your works will not save you good works will not save you but when you are saved salvation will lead you to good works look at this now Jude chapter 1 we're looking at verse 4 Jude 1 verse 4 for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained pre-reaching to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness you know there are people that will say good works don't matter righteous life doesn't matter sanctification doesn't matter new nature doesn't matter when you are saved you can continue whatever you did the bible doesn't say that it's saying your good works before you are saved cannot save you but when you are saved good works will come righteous life will come there's no confusion but there are certain men crept in on unawares who before were ordained unto this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness and denying the only lord god and our savior jesus christ I pray there will be no confusion in your profession of faith in Jesus' name. Look at Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. You are a Jew, circumcised. You are a Gentile, not circumcised all that does not matter you have come to christ and as you have come to christ circumcision availeth nothing on circumcision availeth nothing but faith that walketh by love faith that walketh by love a faith in christ makes us to have love for god and love for one another and the love now will reveal itself by the actions we have look at verse 13 there in verse 13 for brethren ye have been called unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion of the to the flesh but by love serve one another that, that's not the law moses this one is the love of god in our heart that by faith by love we serve one another i pray that this new life of the real believer in christ will be produced in every life in jesus name we're coming to point number three point number three now our life in christ after justification by faith our life in christ after justification by faith we're looking at galatians chapter 2 reading from verse 20 it says i am crucified with christ it says i've abandoned moses 
I've abandoned the law of Moses. I've abandoned all the old covenant injunctions. But now I'm totally with Christ, identified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In the love of Christ that has saved me, not the works of the law, he gave himself for me, is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that brought the justification, the reconciliation, the redemption, and the righteousness. It's not the law of Moses. It says, he gave himself for me. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Those who claim they have the grace of God and they live in their new life as the old life. No change, no transformation. They frustrate the grace of God. Those who claim to have the grace of God and they live a worse life than the criminals who have never tasted of the grace of God, they frustrate the grace of God. Those who say they have the grace of God and they say, I can do anything I want to do. I can yield to the flesh. I can allow the flesh to control me. I can allow Satan to control me because I am saved. I am saved. I have the grace of God. That grace of God is doing nothing in their life. They frustrate the grace of God. And those who say, I have the grace of God, but I leave the grace of God behind, I will have righteousness by my own strength. I don't have to pray. I don't have to lean upon the Lord. I don't have to confide in the Lord. I don't have to hope in the Lord by myself. I have grace, but I'm not going to make use of that grace. For if righteousness come by the law, by self-effort, by self-endeavor, then Christ is dead in vain. I pray that in your life, in my life, the Lord will not die in vain in Jesus' name. Let's look at this now. Our life in Christ after justification by faith. Three things. Number one, the crucified life of believers in Christ. The crucified life of believers in Christ. Number two, the consecrated lifestyle or behavior like Christ, like that of Christ. And then number three, the consistent leaning of believers on Christ. Look at number one. Number one is the crucified life of believers in Christ. Come to that Galatians again, chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. You need to have personal experience. And you need to know the time, the date, when you came to Christ. And in your free volition, you surrender to Christ in a very definite way for a definite experience that you identify with Christ. You might be kneeling down, you might be standing up, whatever your bodily posture, but you know and you remember that you came to Christ for this definite experience of real conversion, crucified dead with Christ, buried with Christ, and then there's a new life, you rose with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Not we are crucified with Christ. Personal identification with Christ. As an individual, you came to Christ in a definite way, and you can say, I know the day, I know the time, 
I know the hour, I know the place, and I know the condition of my heart, and I fully surrendered unto Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Paul, what are you saying? Are you not confusing us? No, not at all. The physical crucifixion will make him die. But this one is not physical crucifixion. This is spiritual crucifixion. This is from the heart of the man, the heart of the woman, the heart of the believer that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is no physical crucifixion. It is a spiritual experience. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Yet not I, I don't live by struggling anymore. I don't live by sleeping on hard ground anymore. I don't live by walking on pebbles anymore. I don't live by punishing myself anymore, thinking, you know, if I punish my flesh, if I punish myself, if I deny myself for sleep, if I deny myself for food, then I'd live the righteous. He said, no, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. It's resurrection. It's not just that he rose from the dead, that living Christ, that reigning Christ, he reigns in me, he reigns in my heart, he reigns in my character, he reigns in my behavior. Reign, Master Jesus, reign. Reign, Master Jesus, reign over every act, over every action, over my behavior, over my identity over my opinion over the old life reign he says but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live not the life of the past not the life under the law not the life under self-righteousness the new life the redeemed life the righteous life the ransomed life the life that is reconciled unto god it says the life which i now live i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me that's the new life of the believer we have passed away from the time of the law now we come to the lord our savior our redeemer our sanctifier and now because he lives inside us he produces the life of christ and the life of righteousness in us we're looking at romans chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 6 romans chapter 6 verse 6 knowing this that our old man is crucified the old man depraved man deceptive man deceptive nature in us that old man old character old habit old nature it says our old man is crucified with him is made impotent invalid is made powerless that old man the life we used to live the character of the past the habit of the past that old nature is crucified and made impotent and powerless it says that the body of sin the total root of sin and the one that generates and produces sin that the body of sin might be destroyed not suppressed destroyed not managed destroyed not enlightened destroyed not controlled destroyed the life of the old man the lust of the old man the anger of the old man and the fretting of the old man it's not just to come under control just to be subdued it's not to be submerged 
uh, within or under many of many other things that you know you try to you grit your teeth when that anger comes and you are boiling on the inside and then you quickly run away from that place so that you will um, you will go to a place nobody will see and the psychologist might tell you let that anger come and then go somewhere and picture somebody in front of you as if that is the person that is causing the anger and every bad thing you wanted to say to that man don't say that in the public that will destroy your success that can take your business away from you that can put you in a class that you lose a lot of things but go in the secret and punch that air and punch that person as if you are fighting a personality that one is psychology that one doesn't work the anger is still there like a tiger like a tyrant like a lion but when you come to Christ and you stretch yourself on the cross of Christ and you're crucified and you can say I am crucified with Christ and the old man is crucified and the body of sin destroyed that henceforth we shall not serve sin you will not serve sin clean and clear that the grace of God in our lives will bring the new life in our lives will totally be new look at verse 7 in verse 7 it says for he that is dead who is that crucified with Christ dead with Christ he that is dead is freed from sin I am free you believe that I am free the Lord confirmed that in your life in Jesus name let's look at number two there number two the consecrated lifestyle or behavior like Christ like Christ what Christ will do what Christ will say how Christ will feel how Christ will act that your consecration your devotion now is to live the life that Christ will live if Christ were here today now when we say living like Christ you have to think like Christ because it's our thought that brings our emotion if something is happening and you look at it you focus on it you don't focus at what you have the grace you have the goodness of God and the provision of God you focus on that thing that focus will bring feeling and then if that thing is a bad thing and you focus on it and you're thinking about that your thoughts and your focus will bring a feeling of it may be a feeling of rejection a feeling of depression a feeling of anger a feeling of worry and anxiety because you have a wrong focus a wrong feeling and because of that the way you feel is how you are now act if somebody did something and you concentrate on that and you don't know who you are a child of the king a follower of Jesus Christ a person that has Christ living on the inside of him and you have to live like Christ if you don't think like that and you have the thought the other way then action will come and when you take an action that is wrong an action that is wrong another action that is wrong it's like you're walking a particular path on a grass field after you walk there up and down a long time you'll make a path on that grass field and naturally anyone coming you just walk on that automatically when you concentrate on the wrong thing on the wrong feeling on the wrong emotion or the wrong act and you act like that every time it becomes your personality 
your personality even without anything to be angry about you get angry nothing to be furious about you get furious nothing to you know shout about be worried about you get furious and you shout and you're worried and you're frightened but now when you come to Christ and you know that all that matters is what Christ will do how Christ will think you have the thoughts of Christ you have the mind of Christ you have the way of Christ you have the behavior of Christ you have the lifestyle of Christ and you are thinking of Christ Christ every every time that lives in you it makes your life what your behavior what your lifestyle ought to be it will happen it has happened already that the life of Christ will be reproduced in your life in Jesus in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 it says I am crucified with Christ we don't have time uh, for me to take you through uh, you know the way it ought to be uh, the way it ought to be is this when you read that sentence you emphasize the I whatever is happening around you you say I I, I, so and so you mention your name, I am, then you emphasize the am, I am, then you emphasize the crucified, 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 old nature, crucified, the way I used to act, crucified, and the way I used to behave, crucified, and then with Christ, with Christ, you emphasize with Christ, and then later you read everything together. I am crucified with Christ. Anything happening around you, you remind yourself, I am crucified with Christ. I used to behave like that, I used to think like that, I used to talk in that other way, but now I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live the life I live now is exciting, the life I live now is productive because nevertheless I live and yet not I I couldn't do this by myself I couldn't act like this by myself there is a power greater than my natural power there is a power greater than my normal self that lives big in me now but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, in the flesh, marriage flesh, in the flesh, bachelor's flesh, in the flesh, spiritual's flesh, in the flesh, the life I now live on earth, no matter my situation, marriage or not married, job or no job, Christ is always happy, I'm happy. Christ is excited, I'm excited. Christ is purposeful, I'm purposeful. Christ is on top of the stormy sea. I'm on top of the stormy sea because the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. Somebody else may doubt the love of God. He loves me. And what I'm going through, some people might say, if you're going through that, maybe God does not love you anymore. He loves me. Why? Love me enough to give himself for me. I pray this will be reproduced in every life in Jesus' name. And then you live like he would have been living if he were here right now. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 21. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even here unto were ye called. Even here unto were ye called. I am called to salvation. I'm called by the Savior. And I'm called to live like the Savior. Because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example that ye shall follow his test. Ye shall follow his test. What does that mean? I look at the life of Jesus. And I look at the way and the place he places is a uh, is, is steps and then i see that step and whatever is happening now i say what will christ do in this condition in this situation how will he think how will he talk how will he live and how will he interact 
that ye should follow his steps. I pray you will follow his steps. Look at Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind that was in Christ Jesus. Now, you're saved by grace. And you come to God by grace. By, by grace and you are inked with Christ by grace now it's not just that I believe in the head I believe in the heart and now I have the mind of Christ the mind of Christ whatever we're hearing in the current affairs the mind of Christ whatever may be happening in economy ecology I have the mind of Christ. Whatever may be up or down, down or up, and whatever storm there may be, the mind of Christ. The mind that knows that whatever the Father has ordained, that is what will happen. And so we are not jolted, and we are not surprised, and we are not uh, distressed or discouraged because we have the mind of Christ. And that is what the new life and the new experience, that is what it does in our lives it says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus and then we're looking at first John chapter 2 verse 6 first John chapter 2 verse 6 he that saith he abideth in him ought also so to walk so to talk so to think so to behave so to act as Christ, as he himself also what He that says, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as Christ walked. Amen? Amen? Look up here. There are times in our lives when things happen, we have the knowledge in our head that Whatever happens, I should live like Christ. The grace is there. The Christ is there. He lives on the inside of you. But when something happens, we have an automatic way of responding, of reacting. We never consult Christ. We never think of Christ. We're too fast in reacting. We're too fast in responding. And when you are like that, the old reaction, the old action, the old feeling is what will pop up every time. You have not even, you know, called for that, but that's what will happen. But if you can slow down, something happened like it always happens. And the normal, regular, habitual thing will try to pop up and say, hold on, slow down, I'm in charge. Because you have to be in charge of your life. You have to be in charge of your action. You have to be in charge of your new life. And then you say, Christ, I thank you because you live in me. You abide in me. Look at my situation here, Christ. If you were here, how will you act? How will you talk? Slow down. If you don't slow down, the old attitude, old action, old behavior will come up again. But when you slow down and you ask the Lord, what shall I do at this time? How shall I respond at this time? What direction shall I go at this time? He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even I see a walk. Your walk victoriously. Your life will take on a new approach, a new excitement, a new victory in Jesus' name. Number three here. In number three, we have the consistent leaning of believers on Christ. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Look up here. Let's say you have, you'll never be sick. I didn't hear your amen. amen. But for illustration, let's say you have sickness 
and then uh, somebody who loves you spoke to a doctor and this doctor is the number one expert in the land sends him to you and he says i learned you have this challenge i'm here to make you overcome the challenge are you neglecting you don't answer him how do you feel no answer what are you going through no answer Set out your tongue let me see the condition on your tongue no response he'll be frustrated because he has the help he has the support he has the knowledge he can make you well in every way in every area of your life but you don't respond to him he will be frustrated until he has to leave now the grace of god is there with us all the time by grace you are saved by grace you are sanctified by grace you are strengthened by grace you are succored the grace of god is available to make you the newest kind of creature you can be and the most successful and righteous that you can be but the grace is frustrated because you never appeal to that grace you never ask for more grace you never depend on that grace you never lean on that grace it's frustrated that's why paul the apostles said by the grace of god i am what i am i go through that challenge the grace is there i come through that persecution the grace is there i come through that misunderstanding the grace of god is there i come through that problem the grace of god by the grace of god i am what i am and the grace of god that was given to me was not in vain because he did not frustrate the grace of God. From today, you will not frustrate the grace of God. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by law, then Christ is dead in vain. What he's saying is, I know that righteousness will not come by the law. I was very familiar with the law. I was very familiar with the law of Moses, but now I've abandoned that, I've thrown away that, because grace has come in place, and I always rely on that grace grace of God and as we rely more from tonight on the grace of God your life will be victorious your life will be righteous and your life will take on a new beauty spiritually in Jesus name grace amazing grace grace that is greater than all our sins and that grace available for you tonight you can come to the throne of grace and require help at a time of need and grace will become abundant in your life in my life in my life grace abundant in Jesus name rise up and tell the Lord and let that grace do its work in your life do not frustrate the grace of God the grace of God will see you through whatever you are going through the grace of God will perfect everything concerning you in Jesus name